1977, I'm watching Star Wars in the theater. I'm saying, this is awesome. The Millennium Falcon, you've got a big Wookiee next to you flying a spacecraft. You can make the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs, whatever that means. But I thought it was darn cool. I said, I need to do this. I need to fly in space. Uh, and my hopes were dashed a few years later, as I said, that my mother mentioned that Harrison Ford plays Han Solo. He plays Han Solo, Mom. Uh, I was still young enough to believe in things like, well, I better not say anything about certain characters we celebrate at the end of the year because the kids are watching. But the point is, I wanted to go into space. Went into high school, and a high school guidance counselor said, well, if you want to become an astronaut, you need to become a pilot. You need to go to the Air Force Academy. And you're in for four years. You get another four years, another four years. And it just started adding up in my mind. So I, I don't think I want to do that. What else can I do? Well, I can talk to people. That's easy. So I'll do psychology. So I uh, changed my dreams. I was going to become a psychologist. I was going to counsel people about their fears and their depressions. Uh, and then in graduate school, I said, I wonder if there's any way I can mix psychology with spaceflight. Is anyone doing this kind of work? And certainly the Russian space program from the beginning, back in 1961 with Yuri Gagarin's first flight, focused on the human factor, the human mind, focused on behavior. But NASA, from the beginning, we wanted the right stuff. We wanted these men who didn't have any problems, psychological problems. In fact, you can go back and look at some of the early NASA, NASA research, and it's all focused primarily on biology. Very little discussion of the mind. And so, as I was thinking about how can I blend these two together, I started looking into what kind of work is going on and sure enough, as we started to get into the 70s, the, the space missions became longer. We had our Skylab program, the first uh, space station, in fact, America's only true space station. Uh, the International Space Station, of course, being a partnership with uh, many countries around the world. So we started understanding that people, when they're on missions longer than a few weeks, some things start to happen. Now, I'm going to go back to science fiction for a moment here. And I know I'm not supposed to read my slides. But um, thank you very much. Got all kinds of things now. Uh, but as I was looking into this, I, I just read recently a book, and I'm thinking, darn it, somebody's already basically made the point that I'm going to make to you today. And this is coming from a book that uh, this author, Robert Heinlein, one of our great science fiction writers, uh, wrote back in 1961, 50 years ago, the same year that Yuri Gagarin first flew, Alan Shepard first flew. I'm just going to read to you the first nine chapters. <laughs> yeah. The first human expedition to Mars was selected on the theory that the greatest danger to man was man himself. Uh oh, that sounds good. What's going to happen here? Eight humans crowded together for almost three Terran years had better get along much better than humans usually did. An all male crew was vetoed as unhealthy and unstable. Four married couples was considered optimum. If necessary, specialties could be found in such combination. All right, sounds pretty good. Hundreds of combinations, lots of volunteers, and they selected uh, a great mission they thought to go to the first human mission to Mars. The crew had all the needed skills, some having been acquired by intensive coaching during the weeks before blast off. More important, they were mutually compatible. The end of the first chapter is the envoy, the spaceship, achieved a parking orbit inside the orbit of Phobos and spent two weeks in photographic survey then Captain Brandt radioed, we will land at 1200 tomorrow GST, just south of Lake Asoli. No further message was received. As you read on, even stranger in a strange land, it tells the story of the first Martian, if you will, the first human that was born in space and comes back to Earth, and he's the stranger in a strange land. But what really struck me in reading that book was the fact that the crew imploded because of psychological problems. And this is science fiction back in 1961, but I'm going to argue today that the greatest limitation for us to go to Mars is not the biology. It's not even the engineering. Jason's going to build us the spacecraft to go to Mars. The engineers will figure out how to protect us against solar radiation and the effects of microgravity on bone density and muscle loss. But to me, I think it's the human side, the human factor, 
and more specifically, the combination of people that's going to be the significant limiting factor. So I argue we need to change our mindset from identifying the right stuff to the right mix of people as we move forward and try to expand beyond lower Earth orbit, go back to the moon, go to some near-Earth objects or NEOs, and hopefully one day go to Mars. Hopefully you recognize these gentlemen here. We've got Yuri Gagarin, first human in space. We've got Al Shepard, our first American in space. Anyone recognize this gentleman here? Neil Armstrong, he did something. <laughs> something important. But these were the men, the original, at least in terms of Shepard, and Ar uh, Shepard was one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts. They were heroes in this country. They had the right stuff. They were rugged test pilots. They were all kind of alpha dogs, if you will. They could go out there and get the job done, and certainly they did in the early days of our space program. Here's Ed White doing the first American EVA. These three gentlemen, again, there's Armstrong and Buzz, who can dance pretty well from what I've heard. <laughs> Buzz Aldrin dancing with the stars, no? no nobody? Okay. Can't can edit that part out later? Okay. <laughs> And then, of course, more Mike Collins, who goes, gets, uh, fails to get noticed here, but Mike uh, was in orbit, they're waiting for the crew to return. So with, with this right stuff mentality, we did great things. But now the mission has changed. Now we have to focus on how do we get a crew of six or eight or four to get along for a three-year round trip to Mars. Now, I'd like six volunteers from the audience to raise their hands. All right. So you six, we're going to go get an old 747. And I'm going to lock you in that 747. We'll only do two years just to see what happens. <laughs> the mixture that I select there is going to be critical. And so what I'm going to talk about just a few moments on is what are some of the considerations we need to take in putting together this optimal crew. Now, don't you think that NASA has already figured this out? You would think that they've spent a lot of time thinking about what, what's the right mixture of men and women and expertise level and nationality to form the most optimal crew. Well, as a matter of fact, this is just a recent call for research from NASA. And one of the areas that they're asking for feedback on is what is the optimal crew composition for long duration spaceflight? In looking at some of the evidence that we have, and we have a lot of data about space crews going back to the early 60s. But we don't have a lot of information about this correlation between the crew composition and their performance. Does NASA like to say, oh, the crew really did not get along and had fist fights and there were problems aboard? Is that good NASA PR? No, it's not. The Russian program has also been fairly secretive over the years about any problems that have occurred. But have we had any problems that could be related to the psychology of spaceflight? Just to give you a couple of examples. Jack Stuster, a researcher, recently uh, completed a report, and he got access to the astronaut journals uh, aboard the space station for a period of time. Quite interesting. He didn't uh, give anything away and let, you know, give any names away. But in looking at the categories of things that the astronauts and the cosmonauts and the other residents described as problems during their stay, you can see that a good number of them were focused on the adjustment aspect, about how can we survive here in this environment. We're locked in this tin can. Second factor, th fourth factor down there was group interaction, getting along with your fellow crewmates. There's a famous quote by a Russian cosmonaut, and I'm paraphrasing, but it basically says that take two people, lock them in a tin can for six months or longer, and you have a perfect recipe for murder. <laughs> Not very comforting to hear from a Russian cosmonaut who is one of your long duration space cosmonauts. But just think of the idea when you guys are in a classroom and you're surrounded by people you don't quite get along with, you can leave at the end of the class. Who's been on the family trip, the two week trip to the Rocky Mountains? <laughs> You're stuck in the car. At the end of that trip, you're ready to leave, aren't you? You want to leave the group of people because you're tired of being around them. This won't happen on a three-year round trip to Mars. You can't go outside and get away from people. You'll be stuck in that 747-sized vehicle for nine months going out. You get to walk around Mars. 
If your legs and muscles are working, you'll get to do some good work. And then you have a nine minute trip home. That's going to be the hard part, I think. You ever come back from a trip with your family? The excitement's over. Now you've got to wait to get home. Just to give you a couple examples of problems that have occurred before that could be related to human behavior and psychology. This was a Soyuz mission uh, that followed a, a trip to a space station, the Russian space station. And Vitaly Zolobov, gentleman here on the right, it's not uh, described here, but he made a kind of an odd request of mission control that he'd like to open up one of the hatches to air out the station a little bit. <laughs> Thought it was getting a little, uh, needed air out a little bit. He also graded down to mission control that he thought that his commander was out to kill him. He'd already heard him over in the corner talking about killing him. And so at that point, mission control said, of course, well, thank you, Vitaly, that's great news. How, let's leave the hatch closed just for today, and we're going to bring you back. So that mission was ended early. And as you can see here, there were some concerns about not only their physical condition, but their mental condition of the crew members. Another example was the Mir collision, which some of you may have read or seen accounts of. And we had one of our American astronauts, Michael Fall, who was aboard Mir at the time. And I won't go into a lot of the detail here. The end result was you had an unmanned progress vehicle smash into the Mir uh, space station, cause a depressurization. We could have lost all three, all three crew members. They were able to survive. But leading up to this, the event that led up to this was a lot was tied to the psychology of the, the commander, the one who was trying to dock this unmanned progress vehicle with the Mir. And there's a lot of concern about the stress that he was under prior to this event. Well, maybe we should study people in space isolation here on Earth. That would be safer, right? If we're up in space, we could have problems like this occur. So maybe we'll lock some people in a, in a fake spacecraft for 120 days and, and see what happens. Well, as you can read here, some of these don't go very well either. This happened back in 1999. It was a, a long-duration study. A lot of things happened. You can see there's a bloody fist fight between several crew members. There was, some have argued, a sexual assault that occurred. I spoke with one of the researchers who was involved in this study, and he said, you know, some of this was tied to nationality differences. This female uh, crew member, uh, noted here, the Canadian volunteer, apparently had been somewhat friendly with all the crew members there, just acting very friendly. The Russian uh, crew members thought, well, maybe she's really interested in me. And so at the New Year's Eve party, kind of at the end of this uh, long year, the Russian man thought, well, now I'm going to make my, make my move here and give her a kiss. So there was a cultural difference there. There was a gender difference there. And this was a, a significant problem. This is something that still gets talked about at NASA as saying, gee, we need to look into this. How do we put the ideal crew together to go to Mars? So some considerations. Are we going to send the Mercury 7? All male crew, all alpha male types, right? How will that work? No. All right, an all female crew. Good? No? Okay, we said no to the all male crew. What is the mixture then? How, what's the ideal mixture? Three men, three women? Should they be married couples? Should they be single? I ask my students a lot uh, this in class, and always we have a great debate about, well, they should be single, so you don't have any fighting. Okay? <laughs> Never mind, they should be married, so there won't be any fighting. Okay? If they're married, they'll stay together. What's the divorce rate in our country? So this one always brings up a lot of, we can go into the whole idea of romantic relationships and the problems that can, uh, can bring, but I won't go into that, because I think this is going to be on the internet. <laughs> what about age? John Glenn flew when he was 77 years old. Can I fly being a 22 year old? <laughs> That's right, 22. So, what age do we put all old people together? Should we mix them up with younger people? Another consideration is nationality. Now, to date, we've only had 50 years of flying in space. And we've only had roughly 500 people have flown in space. Which two nations make up 80% of that population of, of people who have flown in space? United States and Russia. 
So we don't have a lot of, of knowledge base or a large population of sample to say, well, what other nationalities might work well on the long duration mission? It's been predominantly the Russians and the Americans up, to, up till now. But we have to take that into consideration when we're forming this ideal crew to go to Mars. As I said earlier, I'm, I'm not worried about the engineering of getting to Mars. I think we'll figure this out. I'm not worried about the biology. I'm worried about the psychology. I'm worried about the people who, when they look out the, the viewport to see home, to see Earth, that it's, it's a tiny dot, it's a star. We've never had a human being experience that to date, been so far away from home. We've never had humans who have been so far away that it takes 20 minutes for a message from Earth to reach them, and another 20 minutes for that response to come back to Earth. What's going to happen to the crew who radios back to Mission Control and says, we just had a fire? Mission Control, that, that information, that news will be 20 minutes old by the time it reaches Earth. How does Mission Control deal with that? Is the fire out? Is the crew still alive? So they're going to be far away, but I think we'll still overcome those problems. I think the biggest challenge is going to be getting the crew, the right crew, the right mix. This is a version of the Mars Transit Vehicle. We'll have this thing rotate, create some microgravity. We'll be able to keep the crew physically healthy, but how do we keep them psychologically healthy? So I'll kind of end with here with just leaving you some thoughts, and hopefully we can discuss this uh, this afternoon. What is the optimal mixture of people to send to, say, Mars? Is this the ideal crew? Is this the ideal crew? The psychology of spaceflight is something that NASA has ignored early on. But now they're looking at it again. They're understanding that this is going to be a significant factor for the future of human spaceflight. So I think biology will be important, engineering will be important, physics will be important, but psychology will be very important. With that, I will stop. Thank you.